I'm Michael Dickinson, I'm a haematologist at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and Royal Melbourne Hospital and I'm also the disease group lead for aggressive lymphoma in this service. I've been asked to talk today about clinical trials and just to provide a little bit of an overview, particularly on how things work here at Peter Mac and Royal Melbourne. So Peter McCallum Cancer Centre is located in Parkville in Melbourne and we're Australia's largest clinical trials centre. We won more trials here than any other organisation and there's a clinical trials unit called the Parkville Comprehensive Clinical Trials Unit which covers trials run uh, across the different hospital partners here in, uh, in, the, in the area. Peter McCallum Cancer Centre, Royal Melbourne Hospital and the Women's Hospital in particular. And this is a very large unit uh, and the way the unit's organised is according to disease type. So there's a, breast, a group of uh, trial coordinators and nurses who look after breast and lung and colorectal and so haematology is divided up into uh, hematolo uh, three haematology teams and we treat different uh, haematology diseases in different teams. Uh, so for example acute leukemias in team A and lymphomas in team B and myelomas in team C. And so these are clusters of nurses and study coordinators who help uh, run clinical trials. A clinical trial is basically a um, uh, an opportunity for uh, doctors and patients to participate in research about new therapies usually uh, for, uh, in this case, cancer. And so there are clinical trials that involve other interventions, non-drug interventions or radiotherapy interventions or, or, or counselling interventions, but most often when we talk about clinical trials we're talking about some kind of new medicine or new treatment to try to improve upon outcomes of, of uh, the, the cancer in question. And here we're trying to answer a particular research question like, is treatment A plus B better than treatment A alone? Or uh, can these three drugs be combined safely? Or I've got a new drug, uh, uh, is, it, is it safe? And, and is there any signal that it does what it's meant to do? And so uh, these are all different types of trials and they're often called phase one, phase two and phase three trials. And we run lots of these here at this centre. Phase one trial uh, can be basically asking a question about a known drug in a new disease or it can be a drug that's never been tested before uh, in humans and that's often called a first in human phase one trial. And here the question is usually around toxicity. So in typical phase one study, the drug is given at low doses for the first patient or couple of patients, and then we observe patients for a little while, and if we know the drug at that dose is safe, then we treat a few more patients at a higher dose, and we keep going up until we feel that there's a signal that the drug isn't safe at, uh, at higher doses, and that's called a phase one dose escalation study. And it's typical that when the doctors who are involved in running the study feel that we know what the right dose is, to expand, to go into something called expansion, which involves recruiting more patients at that dose to check that it's safe and to get a hint about whether the drug is working. So the study usually has a very focused uh, question, is the drug safe and, is there, and sometimes is there a signal of activity? Uh, and it is possible for phase one studies to roll over into phase two studies or to bolt on a phase two study. And phase two studies are really more focused on uh, being more confident about the safety of the drug that's being given. So instead of treating perhaps a dozen or two dozen patients, treating dozens and dozens of patients to check that a drug is safe, or uh, treating dozens and dozens of patients to get some signal that it's uh, active in a particular disease under question. So it's not uncommon for phase one studies to allow all sorts of different diseases in, while phase two studies focus down, for example, in my space, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma might be the subject of a phase one study or a phase two study, or it may be that a phase one study includes lymphoma and myeloma, but in phase two just includes lymphoma. So phase two studies are often single centre, but can be multi-centre. Uh, and um, again, just larger and, and often without a randomisation. So 
usually every patient gets the experimental therapy in a phase two study and every patient gets the experimental therapy in a phase one study. A phase three study is when we say, okay, we know the new treatment is safe on the basis of the evidence we have so far. And uh, we think that it has some activity in the disease under question. Is it better than our standard approach to the disease under question? And that usually involves a randomization, which means that patients are randomly allocated by some computer or some technique to receive either the standard treatment or the experimental treatment. And that might be one is to one, meaning there's a 50-50 chance, or it might be that the study's designed to give two thirds of patients the experimental treatment and a third of patients the standard treatment. And how the study's designed can vary quite a lot. But usually these studies are much larger there are fewer phase three studies uh, that come out in general because more patients are needed to ask the questions that are asked in a phase three study. And these are usually multi-center studies, so they'd be open at places beyond Peter Mac uh, and Royal Melbourne, often open at multiple sites around the country or globally at multiple sites. And it's not uncommon for phase three studies to involve hundreds of patients and hundreds of sites around the world to get them done, so much, much bigger studies. Um, now, at Peter Mac and Royal Melbourne, and particularly in haematology, our focus has been on trying to develop new drugs, uh, trying to get uh, the best uh, new potential agents from industry and also those things that have been invented in-house, and uh, to really give patients uh, opportunities to access treatments uh, at the earliest possible moment. And that means that for every early opportunity, there is actually a higher risk that the treatment won't work. And I think that's important to understand that um, a phase one study, you're more likely to get a treatment where the dose isn't known and the toxicities aren't known and the activity isn't known than in a phase three study where there might be a chance that you don't get the new treatment, but if you do get the new treatment, there's something known about it. And the doctors who have designed the study and the researchers who have designed the study are making a guess that the new treatment is better than the old treatment based on some information. So I think that's important to understand that there are benefits of being involved in different types of studies but there are also different risks uh, and somewhere in the middle is that phase two where something is known about the drug but often not a lot. Now uh, studies are run by a sponsor and a sponsor is the organisation that has the overall uh, responsibility for the execution of the research and making sure it's done ethically and to a high quality. And it is possible for a sponsor to run uh, multiple sites. And so the best way of communicating this is to say it would be possible for a drug company to be the sponsor of a clinical trial but run it in sites like Royal Melbourne or Peter Mac uh, and then say Royal Brisbane and, and you know, a hospital in Sydney um, and, and that drug company is responsible for the drug and the quality of the drug and the overall conduct of the trial and the doctor at the individual site who's responsible for the trial is called the principal investigator and they're responsible for that site and the overall operations and safety of the trial at that site. It's possible for Peter Mac to sponsor trials and it's possible for groups of doctors to get together and sponsor trials under structured organisations. And those trials are called investigator-initiated trials, which distinguishes them from industry-sponsored trials. And so an example might be the Australasian Leukaemia and Lymphoma Group deciding to do a clinical trial in myeloma or diffusage B-cell lymphoma uh, and setting that up and taking on the responsibilities of safe and high quality execution of that study uh, because a bunch of doctors got together and, and decided on the design and then did so under this organisational structure which can then bear the responsibilities of, of, this, of this kind of high risk research. Uh, it is possible for individual hospitals to sponsor clinical trials. We can do that at Peter Mac, but the majority of studies that we run are either run, either sponsored by industry, big drug companies, uh, small drug companies, or by collaborative group studies, uh, by collaborative groups. But the overall principles in terms of how a study is run are common between them. And so essentially, 
uh, to be involved in a clinical trial, you need to be eligible. And uh, all clinical trials have a protocol, and the protocol is the Bible, basically, for the conduct of that study. If the protocol says, run the study this way, that's the way it's got to be run, and there are no exceptions. And if, there are if an exception accidentally happens, it needs to be reported to the ethics committee. For a uh, protocol to be approved to run, it needs to go through a review of the scientific validity of the protocol and then a review of the uh, ethical structure of the research as well as the way in which the protocol is communicated to patients. And so Peter Mack has its own science review committee and ethics committee and they review all of the trials that we do. Uh, although we do have a mutual acceptance arrangement whereby other ethics committees can review the trials that we do as well in selected situations. And all trials have in common that they have this protocol, or this Bible for running the trial. They also have consent forms for the subjects. And the consent form is an information package which is designed to tell you about the potential risks and the potential benefits uh, of the trial that you're on and also to kind of provide, place that in the context of standard therapy. And one of the challenges of this is that consent forms are often very big, running to 16 or 25 pages for a clinical trial uh, with a lot of detail which can be quite scary to read uh, because generally speaking uh, more information is considered to be better but of course it can be overwhelming and it's important that you ask your doctor to direct you to the most important parts of the consent form but it's also important that you read through it in your own time uh, with plenty of time uh, to think, plenty of thinking space and to highlight a pen so that you can come back and ask questions about the consent form on a subsequent consultation. Our practice here at Peter Mac is to make sure that patients have a consent form for more than a day uh, and are given plenty of time to, to think about involvement in a clinical trial. You don't sign the consent form by yourself. You sign the consent form with your doctor in the presence of your doctor and then only once the consent form is signed do the procedures of the trial move forward uh, and uh, basically your doctor is giving you a consent form when they think that you will be eligible for a trial and in the protocol there's a list of inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria they say for example in the case of a lymphoma study the patient must have a lymphoma they must have had you know three prior therapies they must be on their feet and well they must understand the consent form so their inclusion criteria and their exclusion criteria you know, can't be older than X, can't have had this prior therapy. And a patient needs to fit all the inclusion criteria and all the exclusion criteria. Now, a consent form isn't given to a patient unless we think there's a good chance that that will all turn out to be the case. But it's not uncommon for the workup of a clinical trial to find that a patient doesn't fit the inclusion or exclusion criteria. That period where we're examining whether a patient fits into a clinical trial is called screening. It's usually a defined period of time for screening. And screening consists of uh, getting together all the tests that are required. It might be a PET scan or a staging scan or a repeat biopsy or some blood tests. Uh, and getting all of them into one place and then saying, tick, all the inclusion criteria are met. None of the exclusion criteria exists. You may now proceed. And that's when the treatment, the intervention from a clinical trial uh, begins. Now, during the conduct of a clinical trial, again, I'll just go back to it, the protocol has to be adhered to. And one of the things that's important is that usually for almost all of our trials, with the exception of some of our recent telehealth trials, uh, most of the trials require in-person uh, availability at the treatment site. So we're able to support patients who come from interstate for our clinical trials, but they do need to come. And, uh, and often travel is supported. Lymphoma Australia can advise you on, on some aspects of travel. The hospital has a travel support. Um, uh, and there are other patient organisations that can provide some information about travel. And each state has its own travel associated program. But they're not always built around helping patients get to clinical trials. And sometimes the clinical trial sponsor will be able to provide some financial support for travel. And so it really depends upon the individual clinical trial. It's something you need to ask your doctor. But one thing that's not negotiable is turning up. And turning up for a clinical trial is just something that, 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 um, that uh, we're unable to compromise on because of the way the, the protocols work. Now, um, 
So that's, that's, that's basically how clinical trials work. Some allow treatments to continue indefinitely. Some only provide a certain package of treatment. Some allow retreatment within a clinical trial. Some don't. Uh, they all have different rules that will be relevant to your particular cancer type or for, to your particular prior therapies. Um, uh, but those principles are common across all of them.